On this week's 51%, we speak with author Alicia Fernandez Miranda about her new memoir, My What If Year, and what she learned revisiting her dream careers as a 40-year-old intern. I was exploring all of these different things and things I wasn't necessarily good at. It was so fantastic to know that that was coming again for me. We also hear from a group of students at New York's Emma Willard School, who just launched their first startup company. I'm Jesse King. It's all up next on 51%. I was standing around like one of those girls I had seen in a movie. The whole world was a movie back then. I had my sunglasses on. I wanted to be seen without seeing Shiloh or Lita. I wasn't really in it. I didn't really get it. You're listening to 51%, a WAMC production dedicated to women's issues and experiences. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Jesse King. First off, depending on when you're listening into our program, happy International Women's Day. Rest assured, we've got a full lineup of guests for Women's History Month in the works and coming to you soon. Today, though, is for every woman who has looked at her life and asked, what if? We've all gotten lost in a daydream or given in to a wistful thought of the path not taken, of that job we turned down, the major we changed, the dance lessons we never took, or that city we never moved to. For me, if I could go back in time, I think I'd honestly try to be a scientist, or I'd run a bookstore in the middle of nowhere and raise a bunch of Scottish Highland cattle. I mean, it's not going to happen, but wouldn't it be nice if it did? Our main guest today argues it can, to a certain extent at least. In her new memoir, My What If Year, Alicia Fernandez Miranda captures her experience jetting off from her home in London and going, as she says, from CEO to intern to recapture her spark and explore the careers she had always dreamed of but never pursued. It was 2019 and I was at a point where sort of externally it looked like I had done all the things that I was supposed to do in my career and my life. I was married with two kids. I was CEO of my own company, had achieved a lot of professional success and you know, I've been like a total type A goal oriented person my whole life. And then I did it. I got to the goal. I was like at the place that I was supposed to be. And I found myself just searching for more. I was stuck. I was really unhappy. I felt guilty that I was unhappy and I didn't know why or how to tackle it. And this went on for a while. I think it was kind of slowly building up. And as I was approaching 40, which I know happens to a lot of people when they get to milestone birthdays, this was something that was really on my mind. And I had always had this deep love for musical theater, for the arts, for all these kind of passions that I never really pursued for a number of different reasons. And this idea came into my head, like, what if I went back and tried these jobs as an intern? Because I recognized I had no experience to bring to the table as like, you know, I had a lot of experience in my working life, but I did not have a lot of experience in the theater or the art industry or anything that I was going to do. So I sort of hatched this plan to go back and be an intern, to try out these jobs I always wanted to do and to see what it was like. Maybe it was going to lead me to a career path, but maybe it was just going to be like a nice break from my life. And then I was going to come back, I'd be all refreshed and I could get back on the train and like keep on going to whatever station I was supposed to be going to next. I had the idea for a while. I articulated the idea in January, 2019. And then I sat on it for eight months and did like absolutely nothing because I was worried. I was sure I could never actually pull it off. It seemed so far-fetched. If I mentioned it to some people, they're like, this is a crazy idea. Like you can't leave your husband and kids and go and do this. And so all of those kind of voices, most of them in my head were like, this is not possible. Um, And finally, in sort of the late summer 2019, I just got to the point where the risk of not doing it seemed greater than the risk of doing it because I was so unhappy and I really felt like I needed something to jolt me out of where I was. And so I then spent another six months planning. I'm a real planner. Um, And so how did I do it? Oh my gosh. I chased down everybody I knew. I got on LinkedIn. I looked up what everybody I knew was doing, what their cousins and relatives and second and third degree connections were doing. I reached out to well over a hundred people saying, can we have a coffee? Can we get on a phone call? Can I tell you what my plan is and see if you know anybody that would be willing to hire me as an intern? Um, And then I trolled like all the job boards for internships and applied to a lot of jobs. And mostly nobody responded to me because it was very, very hard to get a free uh, unpaid job as a former CEO and like want to be intern. And so eventually, um, like with many internships, I think it was my network that kind of paid off. How did your family react when you said you wanted to go on this year long adventure? Were they receptive to it at all? My husband was at first 
uh, nervous about it. I think, you know, we had built our company that I was running together. And so that was something he had to deal with emotionally, this idea that I didn't want to do that job anymore. And that was something we had worked on together. And then the logistical part of it, you know, like he was going to be staying with the kids. There were list after list I made of what day everybody goes to which after school activity and what you need to pack for lunch on Tuesdays. And, you know, God forbid you put nuts in the lunchbox because, you know, there's a kid with a nut allergy at school. You can't do that. All of these little things that were part of my mental load that I kind of kept in my head, I had to transfer over to him. I think he was a little bit overwhelmed at the beginning, to be totally honest. The kids were... My twins at the time were eight when I started this, and they were sort of like vaguely interested in it. Um, When it started to affect their real life, like mommy wasn't home, that was really upsetting for them. Um, And I think they didn't understand why I wasn't there like I was supposed to be. But to their credit, they kind of went through the journey with me. And now they're like, so they're really proud, I think, of what I managed to achieve. They came on the first leg of my book tour with me. My book just came out a few weeks ago. And my daughter said to me at one point, she was like, mommy, I'm just, I'm so proud of you for doing this. And that just like really, really touched me. So. Well, you picked a heck of a year to go on an adventure, basically 2020. You were working on some Broadway shows right as COVID-19 lockdown started happening at the start of the pandemic. What was that like? And I guess, do you feel like you got much of the authentic Broadway experience you were looking for? Do you know, that's like such a good question. And I think that for the time I was there, um, which was about two and a half weeks of what was supposed to be a full month, I did kind of have, I think, a a pretty authentic experience because up until the moment that theaters closed, I think everybody was just, you know, the show must go on. Like this is an industry that has fought through so many different things. Broadway had only ever closed before, you know, the longest it had closed in recent memory was two days for 9-11. So this idea that theaters were going to be closed for an extended period of time, that was like not registering with people. And I remember I was in the Classic Stage Company offices. So Classic Stage is a fantastic off-Broadway theater. They were about to mount a production of Assassins, which I, which I was sitting in on rehearsals and shadowing. And it was uh, in a smaller theater with a few hundred seats. And I was there when the governor announced that they were closing all theaters, you know, any event over, I think it was 500, which meant every Broadway theater was closed or whatever the exact stat was. And even at the time, I think people were still like, oh, well, this doesn't affect our theater. You know, we're still going to go ahead because our theater is smaller. So I think that there was a real general sense, almost of disbelief, that this was actually as big as it was. And I think that was probably mirrored in a lot of the rest of the world because, you know, I think a lot of people were, were feeling that way. But for me... That time I was there was cut short. I would have loved to see more. I would have loved to actually see the show go all the way through. You know, it was a year and a half before those shows actually ended up being able to be performed for audiences. But for the time I was there, it really was the most extraordinary thing in the entire world to just be part of a production and see it go ahead. (laughs) So you were a tech on Broadway. You also worked in the fitness industry. You entered the art world at Christie's Auction House and you worked at a hotel in Scotland. How did doing these different gigs make you feel? Were there some that you were like, oh, I kind of wished I had maybe gone more this route? Or are there others where you're like, you know what? I'm good. (laughs) (laughs) I think it was really a mix. I mean, you know, even the things that were the toughest, I found myself really grateful to be able to do because how lucky was I to be able to go back and like have these experiences, you know, at, at a point where I could really appreciate them. Not when I was an intern, like when I was 20 and I was like, Oh God, I have to get someone coffee. Like this is the worst. Now I was like, please let me get you coffee. I would love to get you coffee. My fourth internship was in a restaurant and hotel. And I had always like dreamed of this like very Netflix fantasy, you know, buy a rundown Scottish castle and turn it into a B and B and Oh my God. What a challenging, physically challenging, emotionally challenging industry to work in. And I was so, so bad at it. Every day I was bad. It was one of the things that I have done in my life where I didn't get any better from the last day to the first day. I was just like consistently bad the entire time. (laughs) So um, don't think I would be going into the hotel industry, like to be part of it from afar, I think, uh, and the restaurant industry. The art industry was, you know, I had studied art. I had almost got into art back in my, right after I graduated college and my kind of options split into two directions and I took a totally different path. And I had always really wondered, like, could this have been a job for me? Um, And I loved working for the art, you know, I worked for a contemporary art dealer 
who buys and sells high-end paintings and sculptures. I loved being around art. I loved that going to galleries was like part of my job that I needed to do. And I found that there were actually a lot of skills that were pretty transferable from all the other things I had done in my life into the business of buying and selling art. So I'm actually still working now with the art dealer a few days a week, taking on all kinds of different things because I, I did love that. And I realized after I finished my internship, like this is something I want to keep doing. So you called this sort of like a coming of middle age story. Can you tell me a little bit about what you meant by that? Yeah, you know, it it felt for me a lot like that period where I was coming of age. Like there were a lot of parallels, I think, in between about to turn 40, approaching the middle stage of my life and being a kind of adolescent teenager and then finishing college and approaching the beginning of my career life where, you know, it, it recreated a lot of that for the first time in a long time. I had a blank page in front of me and I could put on it what I wanted to. And I was exploring all of these different things and things I wasn't necessarily good at, which was part of the fun really. And it was so fantastic to know that that was coming again for me, that I think I was entering a new stage in my life and it wasn't like all of this stuff was over, but I was kind of able to have these opportunities all over again. I now think I should probably keep doing this like every decade. I should just find something new and exciting to do. The next one, I'm going to be a wedding singer, I think for my fifties, that's going to be my next uh, thing. But I think there are a certain, I see it with the people who've been reading the book and connecting with it with a lot of my friends. I think there's a lot of parallels between kind of entering this middle phase and entering that very beginning of your professional life and, you know, being able to say, what do I want to do now? What do I really want to do? You mentioned that you're still doing some work in the art world. Do you think this helped your career at all on a, on a broader scale? I think it's made me a better leader in general. I am an ex-CEO now, so I did step back from my oh, CEO okay. role. I'm the chair of the organization, so I'm still involved and I still do work with clients that I've worked with for a long time. But I think that where it really impacted that side of my work is it reminded me how vitally important all of those pieces are from what the intern is doing to what the CEO is doing. I think there's a tendency, you know, even when you try really hard not to forget what it was like to be the person doing the filing and getting the coffee, like a lot of time goes by and you do kind of forget what it was like, what it was like to be in a room full of people who know what they're talking about and not know what you're talking about, right? And what that feeling is like and what you bring to the table if you're a fresh pair of eyes and you haven't been involved. It was a really good reminder of how important that is and what that actually felt like that I think has made me reflect more on how I lead, how I you know, kind of work with that team, how I work with others who are at very different stages of their career and making sure that there's space for everybody, including the interns, including the junior staff. And that, you know, it's a reminder that even the most senior people, I think it's good to go back and do those things because mm -hmm. it's a great way to connect with what the work is you're actually doing, whether you are a consultant or you're selling art or you're in fitness or you're making widgets. I want to talk a little bit about the logistics of how you did it. Obviously, you had your husband at home to support you and watch over the kids in those moments where you were away. You had the means financially to take the time off. What did you need to get it done? If you had any advice for people who maybe wanted to pursue something like this, what do they need to be aware of from the get-go? I mean... I'm a very organized person, perhaps too organized, I think sometimes. One big learning for me was that I can't control everything in the world. I think we all learned that in 2020. So, um, but being organized was was pretty important because it's not like I was in a place where I could just be like, all right, husband, kids, job, goodbye. I'm walking out the door. I'm not talking to anybody for the next 12 months. You know, that was not the reality of it. The reality was that I was up early making phone calls and checking in on emails. I was still the person that the school was calling if somebody was sick, even though I was on the other side of the ocean, you know, so I couldn't just give up all of those other responsibilities that I had to do. And the way that I dealt with that was by being extremely organized. You know, I knew what was going on when I had things kind of laid out very clearly. That is leaning into my strengths and my comfort zone, probably maybe a little too much. But, you know, I think that's really important to know what it is that you want and then to be organized to make sure that you're not sacrificing the things you've worked for, the other very important pieces of your life. You know, at 40, I didn't have the luxury to just like go off and do, you know, and eat, pray, love. I couldn't just go to Bali and go surf. I would have loved that actually, but I couldn't do that. <laughs> so making sure that I could kind of keep that balance and it was stressful. That's something else people should know. It was not, you'll read it in the book. Like it wasn't just fun and games the whole time, although I did have a lot of fun. So I think being organized is really important. And I think the other key thing for people that are like actually considering this is 
you kind of have to get over any um, shame or worries about rejection because the only way that I actually got these internships was by, when I say I went to everybody I knew, I really did go to almost everybody I knew. And a lot of people didn't respond. A lot of people turned me down. A lot of people said they couldn't make it work or they questioned my idea. And, you know, you have to be ready for that. I think that it's a great thing to go out to your network and ask them to take a meeting or have a coffee. And a lot of people are going to say no, and that's okay. That is okay. It is kind of a numbers game, like getting any job. You need to go to a lot of people to get a few meetings, to get just one or two yeses. And so I think people need to keep that in mind as well. You know, I know it's not necessarily everybody's cup of tea to go take a what if you're like this, but honestly, I think if you have the ability to do it, it was just life changing for me. And I would highly recommend it. Do you think there's ever a too late? Is there a prime window people should be looking at for something like this? No, I don't think it's too late. I think, you know, I've met people, I've been traveling across the U.S. the last three weeks on my book tour. I've met people in their 20s who realized what they wanted to do in college and change their major, or change their path. I've met people in their 70s or even 80s who have brought, taken up new skills or new hobbies now that they've never done before in their life. So I don't think it's too early or too late. Like, I think that you can have a what if at any time of your life. It's going to look different at different stages, but I think it is an opportunity for everybody to really question what is it that drives you? What brings you joy? What are your passions? And how are you making sure that you're being true to them every day and true to your values? Because you only get one shot. So you kind of have to do your best with it. You know, it doesn't have to be a whole year. You can bring what if into a new skill, a sport that you've never tried, a hobby that you gave up. You know, there's so many different ways to start rekindling that spark inside of you. And if the idea of a year feels very intimidating or not at all possible, then don't do a year. Just do a weekend, maybe, and see how it goes from there. Alicia Fernandez Miranda is the author of My What If Year, out now through Zibby Books. You can learn more at her website. That's AliciaFMiranda.com. Alicia, thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. Many people dream of starting their own business, but few manage to do so before they finish high school. At the Emma Willard School, a private all-girls high school in Troy, New York, a group of students recently launched the school's first startup company. Notice Volunteer is an app that's aimed at connecting students with service opportunities at local nonprofits. WAMC's Lucas Willard, also host of The Best of Our Knowledge, met with the students who, in their senior year, are now running their own business. Before she became CEO of Notice Volunteer, Emma Willard School 12th grader Manasa Bala already had an interest in how technology impacts the human experience. After the pandemic disrupted daily life, Bala came back to school at Emma Willard in her sophomore year. She wanted to find a way to get involved in the community. And with so much disconnect around us and also the national labor shortage that's been going on, we found that It's really hard to kind of bridge the gap between people who are looking for service volunteer opportunities and nonprofit organizations that don't really have the the platform or the resources to find the volunteers that are looking for their kind of work. Students at Emma Willard have the opportunity to participate in the school's signature program. The year-long capstone course allows juniors and seniors to immerse themselves in their independent interests. Bala has teamed up with two fellow students to make the app user-friendly as she demonstrates the program on a tablet. But basically, a volunteer, they're going to see this Discover page, and these are all events that are recommended to you based on, right now, date, and since we're local, it'll be by location as well. Before developing the software behind the Notice Volunteer app, Bala had plenty of coding experience. I had some background. I had built multiple websites in the past, just multiple web apps, and kind of just got my hands dirty through project-based learning. So I cloned different fl- platforms like Facebook and Google. And- but while Bala has coding skills, she needed help with design. That's where Carissa Gu, Notice Volunteers co-founder and president, came in 
using her background in fine arts. Yeah, mostly like principles of design, like shape language, um, color theory. Um, I chose like a color red for more excitement. While initially limited in her design experience, Gu honed her skills while shaping the look and feel of the Notice Volunteer brand. My first like pass of designs were into really co cohesive, um, but when I thought of the brand, I came up with the name, the logo, and the color scheme, um, and that really took us in the direction that we're on right now. The third co-founder, Angel Wong, serves as Notice Volunteer's chief operating officer. Her specialty is guiding the business's direction and keeping the team together. So Notice Volunteer is the three of us, but also um, a group of other people that help us complete everything we need to do. While Bala and Gu were the ones originally going out into the community to make connections, Wong says the company now has its own team dedicated to outreach. Like her business partners, Wong came in with some experience, but the project has helped her develop her skills and leadership. As I've worked on it, I've realized that it's a very interesting thing to do, to work with a group of people and accomplish something to share with the rest of the world, and I think I really want to pursue this in the future. Notice Volunteer was launched in November of 2022 with a preliminary goal of helping to connect users to 13 nonprofit and service organizations in New York's capital region, a small fraction of the over 1,200 that operate in the area. Wong said the team was looking for ways to engage more organizations as well as students. We're currently in the middle of planning our pilot event, uh, which will hopefully include directly contacting schools for students to be able to um, have an opportunity to get on the app and also uh, coordinating with all of our service organization partners to start posting around a specific date so we can get it all together. Notice Volunteer has already received positive feedback. Michelle Hogan, president of the Junior League of Troy and strategic client executive for New York State Government at Microsoft, said the program gives nonprofits a voice and, quote, has the potential to empower individuals to take notice of how they can apply their own superpowers to support their own communities, end quote. Bala says the software not only bridged a gap in the community, but also kind of became a glue with graduation approaching later this spring, the students all say they'd like to stay involved and continue to improve Notice Volunteer, even after they receive their cap and gown and go their separate ways for college. We built this group in the school that, honestly, I did, a lot of the people that we work with now, I wouldn't have hung out with in the first place. But as we kind of started just getting this going, meeting with nonprofit organizations and realizing that we can actually build something out of this and learn more about ourselves, our skills, and become just better people <laughs> by working together. Um, that's special to me, and I want to pursue that in the future. The Notice Volunteer app is currently available on iOS devices. That was WAMC's Lucas Willard reporting. Before we go, in case you somehow missed the onslaught of sign-up sheets and cookie booths, it's Girl Scout cookie season. The Girl Scouts of the U.S. says its cookie program is one of the largest girl-led entrepreneurial programs in the world, which, in addition to covering troops' expenses, gives Scouts the chance to work on their money management and people skills. More and more, though, Scouts are using their own online stores to broaden their customer base. And this year, there's a new cookie in the lineup. The Girl Scouts of Northeastern New York recently stopped by our studios in Albany to give us a taste of the Raspberry Rally and the year ahead. 17-year-old Isabel Savage is a longtime Girl Scout with Troop 3480, and 10-year-old Savannah Gale is with Troop 1450. Amanda Allen is the organization's director of product program. So our big goal is to sell um, 798,000 packages of cookies. Uh, we're hoping to do um, another big donation for our Council Gift of Caring. Last year we donated um, over 24,000 packages and we'd always like to do more. And so I'm really hoping to get closer to that 30,000 mark. Tell me about the Raspberry Rally. This is the new cookie, kind of like the Thin Mint, but Raspberry instead. That's sort of the vibe that I'm getting from it. Yeah. Yeah. What's the vote on the new cookie? How do you like it? I like the chocolate, not as much the fruitiness of it. Mm, okay. 
I like it because I kind of like the texture of the Thin Mints. And I've also missed having a fruity cookie because if you go back to like my early cookie selling days, there was Thank You Very Much, although that had like pieces of fruit in it. So I kind mm. of like just like the crunchy fruit flavor to the Raspberry Rally. Now, when I was a Girl Scout, I remember doing the whole door to door thing with my mom and like nervously knocking on each door and asking my neighbor if they'd like to buy a box. I did the whole booth sales thing too, but how are you guys doing it now? I'm assuming it's changed a lot because it's been a long time since I've been in it. Um, now there's like um, an online, online store and we sell at cookie booths and not a lot of people go door to door anymore. The Raspberry Rally that you were talking with the other Girl Scouts here today is part of our new lineup and it is exclusively offered online for shipped only. So you can only get it shipped to your home. Uh, we've had Digital Cookie, which is what uh, Little Brownie Baker, our baker company, is what we use to sell digitally online. And that's been around for quite a few years, but you know, every year we try something a little bit new. So they do have troop links. So each troop um, has their own link. You put in your zip code and then it loads up a troop that's close to you that you can order ship cookies from. Yeah, I still sell at Cookie Booths. I've been selling at Cookie Booths for seven years, I think now. And I, I was very grateful that online was introduced because I have a lot of relatives that live in other states. And so it's very easy for me to just send them the link and be like, hey, you can still order from me. You can still support me. You don't have to go to any other girls. <laughs> Has it encouraged you to like come up with different selling tactics or do you do a lot of like online marketing now even? So the online part, I send a link to my relatives, but I also... I carry a case of cookies around school during cookie selling season, and I put the QR code for my website on the box, so that way if kids want to make sure that I like have a specific order for them, they can still they can order from me that way. Cool. And overall, like, what are some of the things that you guys are up to this year? What's on What's on the docket in terms of like activities, badges? What are your goals? Um, last year, at the end of the year, we voted on badges we would like to do. One of them that we already finished was the writing badge. You have to write poems. So, so far this year, we've been to Seneca Falls two different times. The first time we went, we went as a larger group, mm -hmm. and we were there for the National Women's Hall of Fame induction ceremony. And then while we were there, we were invited back for the grand opening of the new National Women's Hall of Fame location, which is at the old Seneca Falls knitting mill. <laughs> um, we also have a trip to Disney World planned for this summer with the National JSUSA convention. So that's where the voting process would come in of like Girl Scout policy decisions, but also like, does anybody have any new ideas for like new cookies, new programs, new badges, like national initiatives? Do you have like a favorite badge? Is, like, is there one activity that you really are proud of? Um, the robotics badge. Ooh, what do you have to do for robotics? Um, this year we learned if something was has its own intelligence or artificial intelligence. Wow. <laughs> you were just showing off some badges in the green room as well. What were some of those charms that you got? Some of them were for outdoor day. We learned all the skills from um, doing stations that the older girls taught us how to do. Hmm. I have a badge on my vest, and this was not a specific badge that you can go to a program to earn, but I've been going to this summer camp, Hidden Lake, for the last 12 years, I think. Um, and I just have, it's a big badge on the back, and it just says Hidden Lake Camp, 12 years. So that's not a badge you can earn from going to a program, but it just shows that I have a really long commitment to both Girl Scouts and to that camp itself. Right now, it really gives me like a sense of community because you have these girls that have stuck through it for 13 years and you're you're really close with those girls. Um, we do a lot of volunteering and also just kind of bouncing off of something that Savannah said earlier. She said that she was taught a couple of programs by older girls. And so now I am one of those older girls that is teaching those programs to those younger girls and passing it on. What's your top cookie? Adventurefuls. They're like a caramel brownie cookie with like chocolate drizzle and, a re and they're really yummy. Yeah, that sounds like a good choice. <laughs> Adventurefuls are good, but I tagalongs are my favorite. So how's the response so far? You know, so far, so good. I mean, I we're doing really, really well. Uh, I believe the last order I saw on Digital Cookie uh, was close to 60,000 packages or so, and we just started our sale on February 10th. Uh, we also um, have National Cookie Weekend, which is uh, March 3rd through the 5th. 
we kind of treat it like a sneak peek because actual booths start March 31st. So you're really trying to push the cookies that weekend. It's like, hey, you can get them before all, like, all the kind of chaos of actual cookie season starts. Isabel Savage and Savannah Gale are members of the Girl Scouts of Northeastern New York. Amanda Allen is the organization's director of product program. Their cookie season runs through the end of April. You can learn more and test out the cookie finder at girlscoutsneny.org. You've been listening to 51%. 51% is a national production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio in Albany, New York. It's produced and hosted by me, Jesse King. Our associate producer is Jody Cowan. Our executive producer is Dr. Alan Shartok. And our theme is Lolita by the Albany-based artist Girl Blue. A big thanks to Alicia Fernandez-Miranda, Amanda Allen, Isabel Savage, Savannah Gale, and Lucas Willard for contributing to the show this week. Next week, we recognize International Women's Day and Women's History Month. We hope you'll join us. Until then, I'm Jesse King, 51%. I was every single girl, I was nobody else, I was so sure of myself I was fifteen and a half, he was a hollow laugh And I lost my cool somewhere along the way The night met on the hallway, I had to learn how to look away I lost my cool Sweet.